Hello everyone, this is Ishan and welcome to ICI lecture series. I will be recording a few mini lectures uh, on various economic topics. This time the focus is going to be on the COVID-19 pandemic situation and how different economies of the world responded to it, how they are trying to recover at the current time. Uh, primarily my focus is going to be on India and Australia. However, I will also focus on a few other countries that I feel have an impact globally. So I'll begin today's lecture on India. And my focus today is purely going to be on a very narrow topic so we can actually think more about one thing at a time. I'm not going to cover everything today. Um, I will be covering things in 19 different videos. So today's focus is purely based on the border lockdown. So the country's international borders being closed in India. So that's the focus today. So borders in India were closed on 22nd March 2020. Now, some people might argue if this is the accurate date, it doesn't matter. It was around this time. Um, now, basically, the borders were closed to anyone who was a non-citizen. Um, when I say borders closed, it literally means no one's allowed inside. However, a few citizens were allowed. There were a few flights that were still uh, that still continued to bring Indians from different countries back to India. Later on, this was made even more stringent. Even if you were a citizen of India, you were not allowed in the country. However, we still had a few politicians travel in and out of the country or probably just get back to the country. We had a few diplomats who continued to get back to India and we had a few rescue flights as well, bringing Indians back to the country. Now, even OCI card holders, that's overseas citizens of India, initially they were not allowed in the country either. However, now the restrictions have been eased and OCI holders are being allowed back in the country, but um, not all of them. Uh, it's, it's pretty complex situation. We don't have enough flights at the moment to get everyone back. So there is a priority listing and there is a waiting list based on which the OCI and other citizens of India could return back to the country. But basically this was the initial response. Borders were closed and people were not allowed to get into the country. So the isolation model was being followed and this was being followed elsewhere as well. This was seen uh, in many other countries in Australia as well. And I will cover how those countries responded uh, in my other videos. Um, let's have a look at a few numbers now, because when we think about air travel, I'm pretty sure we all imagine or picturize the airport at Delhi, Bangalore or Mumbai airport, which is pretty crowded. But let's uh, get an idea. Let's look at um, things from the perspective of numbers to get an idea of the magnitude of the situation. So since 1987 until now, if we take out a monthly average okay, for, for the last so many years, for the last 33 years, the monthly average okay, of arrivals of visitors in India is 2.6 lakhs. So that's a pretty huge number, 2.6 lakhs of people visiting India on an average every single month. So that gives us an idea about how many people would have continued to enter the country if we hadn't closed our borders. So, of course, there are a lot of arguments for and against borders being closed down. But let us be very practical. When you have a pandemic situation and you want to contain it, you cannot have 2.6 lakh people entering the country every single month. So that's one of the significant numbers, uh, which is astonishing. Now let's look at more recent numbers. Just a month before the lockdown was announced, that is February of 2020, we had 10 lakh visitors enter the country. So this is way more than the average. The average is 2.6 lakhs per month. In Feb, there were 10 lakh people who entered the country. And I'm pretty sure this is because, um, it, it could be because of tourism, because in um, so the countries that are close, to um, India, those countries usually have their um, uh, educational period or academic calendar start in March. So there could be a lot of youngsters entering the country. Now, based on the education industry, you have many other businesses as well who operate. So there could be a lot of those people too. Um, it could be tourists, it could be many other types of visitors, one simply visiting back home for holidays, and some probably uh, realize that there is a pandemic in the making and they probably were following WHO closely. Um, instead of just accusing WHO of not acting, these people probably are the ones who decided to get back to the country. Regardless of the reasons, they could be seasonal, they could be economic, uh, they could be regular trends for February. Regardless of that, this number was pretty high. We had 10 lakh visitors 
entering India in February of 2020. In March, that's when the panic actually began to reach its peak. And this is before the lockdown was announced, okay, before the borders were closed. Um, in March alone, there were 3 lakh visitors who entered India. So the numbers just keep going high and high. So we already have 3 lakh people come into India before, just in the month of March of 2020, before the borders were closed. So this is quite a huge number and uh, something for us to think about later as well. Now, just breaking down things a little bit for the purpose of understand, getting a perspective, the ratio of citizens and non-citizens, when I say visitors to India, I mean anyone who is traveling to India, whoever is entering India from overseas. Now, those people could be citizens, they could be non-citizens. Uh, when I broke down, when I checked the data and I broke it down into uh, the number of non-citizens and citizens, I found it was equal. So it was proportionate to each other. It was almost one is to one. For example, if there are 1,000 Indians arriving, there are 1,000 non-Indians arriving. So it was equal if we look at the ratio. So if you want to break that down, logically, we could say if 3 lakh people came to India in the month of March, out of those 3 lakh, it is safe to say, approximately 1.5 lakh were Indian, but 1.5 lakh were non-Indians. They were non-Indian citizens, okay? Um, they could be OCI holders, so they could be of Indian origin, but they were not the citizens of India. So that is still a huge number, 1.5 lakh foreigners coming to the country just in the month of March alone. And that is before 22nd, so that's in 21 days, this was the number of arrivals. Now, the, the next breakdown is not very relevant to COVID-19 situation, but just to get us a little idea about the gender imbalance, I would say, about the number of people coming to our country. So overall, if we were to look at the entire 3 lakh people who came in March or 10 lakh people who came in Feb, on an average, the ratio of men to women traveling to India is 60 to 1. That is, that's a huge imbalance, okay? So more women are traveling to India, so men are traveling to India against women. So one is to 60, 60 is to women. For if, if there are 61 people traveling, 60 are men, one is a woman. So that's the ratio basically. But if we further break it down to just the non-citizens, so remember what I told you, the number of citizens to non-citizens is one is to one. But if I break it down into men and women, and I focus just on the non-citizens, so non-Indian citizens coming to India, then the ratio is okay. Then it is three is to two, so three men to two women. So if five people are traveling, three of them are men, two of them are women. So for non-Indians, the ratio is okay. But when it comes to Indians coming back to India, the ratio, the proportion of men is way higher. Okay, so that is something for us to think about later, not probably in this video, but it gives us a little idea about who is going out and who is coming back to India when it comes to the genders who travel overseas. So something for us to think about later, isn't it? Uh, 60 to 1 is astonishing, seriously, but 3 is to 2 uh, is understandable. So these were the number of people arriving. Let's have a look at from which countries um, these people were coming from, because I said they are visitors, but um, among the visitors, um, what countries are they traveling from? Okay, what is their country of origin? So what passport do they hold? So that's the particular focus. So um, I'll do a video on Australia later on, and you will see in Australia, um, China, uh, people from China are the number one arriving uh, nation and um, cohort. But that's not the case for India and India in 2018. Now, we don't have the country breakdown at the latest uh, latest point, but this gives us a decent idea of what the trend is. So in 2018, people from Bangladesh were the number one entrance to India. It was the largest cohort of uh, foreign nationals coming to India. So 21.37% people arriving in India were from Bangladesh, uh, followed by USA, then UK, and then we had a little bit from Sri Lanka, Canada, Australia, Malaysia, China, Germany, and the Russian Federation. Um, rest of the countries are very minuscule. They're very minor. They're not significant compared to these particular arrivals. So this is something to 
um, think about when we, so especially, you know, when we had this little attitude going on in India that foreigners are bringing in the virus and they should be contained. Um, something to think about later on, and I'm going to raise a few questions at the end of my presentation. And that's where we will come back to this slide where a significant number of people are not from China when they are coming to India. It is from US, UK, and Bangladesh. So something to think about, guys. Now, who says it's only by airplane? How many of you were only picturizing an airplane when we were talking about borders closing down? Borders are not restricted to airplanes. It's not restricted to air. So we have people arrive in India by sea and also by land. So let's have a little idea about how many people are entering India or visiting India on an annual basis. So I'm looking at an annual a yearly average, okay, for the three modes of transport. So of course, air transport is the most popular and that's why most of us probably uh, only picturized airplanes. 63 lakh people arrive in India every single year by air, 63 lakhs, okay? Average every single year by air. Six lakh people arrive by land. So that is actually crossing the borders. It could be car, it could be walking, it could be legally legal. Uh, whoever is reported and whoever is accounted for, there are six lakh people arriving in India on an average every single year. And then the least popular mode is by boat, of course, or by ships. So I said boats because they could be arriving by boats. I said ships because it could be a tourist cruise liner as well. Okay, it could be a passenger ship. So 50,000 arrive by sea. So that's not a very significant number. Half a lakh people arriving in India by sea on an average every single year. So the news that I have been checking out and I have been following has really focused heavily on the arrivals in India by air. And this is actually in many countries, the media is focusing on the airports and the air transport. The area that is neglected and the area that I feel we could engage in a conversation is also the people who are arriving by ships and people, so by sea, and people who are arriving by land. So those six and a half lakh people arriving every year on an average in India by the two not so popular modes of transport should also receive um, some media attention. And I think we could also engage in that discussion at some point of time. Now, why do people travel to India? So we have different types of visas that have listed. You can have a look at them. So we got people coming on a tourist visa, on an X visa. X visa is basically um, a long-term visa um, that allows you to stay over a period of one year or more than one year. So we, not going into the visa details, but X visa is basically a very long-term entry visa into India. Then you of course got people coming for employment and for business. Those who are foreigners or Indians living overseas and have a business in India or have invested in India, those people travel a lot. You have people who are employed. If you look at many multinational companies and foreign corporations, uh, look at their hierarchy and chart, look at their organizational structure and the employees, you will find a lot of people are actually hired who come from overseas. So not everyone is of Indian origin who is working. So you've got people who are working in India, you have people who are doing business in India, you have people who want to stay for a long time in India, you have people who want to visit India for tourism purposes. Then, of course, there are a lot of students as well, international students who come to Indian universities. Now, Indian education is not a huge export yet, but that does not mean that we don't have foreign students. We have a lot of international students in India, especially in Pune or Pune. We have a lot of students who are coming down from South Korea and from China, even Thailand, uh, just for the, uh, for the purpose of studies. So we do have international students. Of course, it's not a significant number, but we do have them. Then you have journalist visas, people from different countries who travel to India to cover news. Of course, the media over here is, uh, is the Indian media, but you've got foreign media, foreign correspondents, you know, in India of different channels as well. So they need a visa to enter the country, can't just come in. A lot of movies are shot in India. Uh, recently, we had a movie on Netflix, Extraction. Um, some parts were shot in India. A lot of parts were shot in uh, Bangladesh, but you need those filmmakers and their crew to get a visa as well. So they also um, are one of the people who arrive. Then you got research visas for scholars, uh, visiting faculty, you got scientists, 
who visit the country and then we got medical visas as well of doctors uh, in different hospitals who could be visiting again for um, operation for, for the purposes of conducting operations or seeing patients you could have actually patients as well who could be sent to india from different countries for getting a treatment so if we look at the reasons to travel apart from the types of visas we see that the top six actually the top five okay types of uh, reasons to travel a holiday and tourism so that's the number one reason if we look at all the visitors in india uh, which cohort or what is the main reason for travel uh, the significant reason it's holiday and tourism at number two we got business at number three we got employment so interestingly the number of business people arriving in india is more than the people employed in india from overseas then education and the last one is relatives. So I would have thought relatives would, would be at a little higher level, but interestingly, it is not when we look at the data. It is at number five. So someone visiting their friends or family uh, is the fifth uh, reason, the, 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 out of the top five, it's the fifth reason uh, as a reason to travel to India. Now, I have added a sixth one because that's not officially noted everywhere, but I had to really dig deeper and get the numbers to get this out. I would say the number six reason to travel to India is uh, missionaries. So we have a separate missionaries visa as well that Indian government allows. There is an application process just like any other visa. There has to be a body or an institution in India that approves, uh, provides um, the reason for travel to the person traveling from overseas. So we have a lot of institutions in India who would say we have uh, visiting uh, missionaries to India and then the Indian government would process the paperwork, uh, which is all legal, of course. It is legally allowed. It's in the system. Uh, the category is called missionaries visa. So they are also a significant number of people, a cohort of people traveling to India. So now we know the reasons to travel. We know the types of visas, uh, why people are traveling, on what visas they are arriving. We have seen the numbers as well, which are pretty significant. We had a little breakdown of gender as well to get a little perspective. So moving on, I have a few questions for us to discuss. So keeping this data in mind, because my focus today is just border closed down and who is coming how. Okay, so we have seen what the situation, what the response was. We have seen how many people are coming in. Just to recap a lot, <laughs> that's the answer, but uh, monthly average is 2.6 lakhs. That's monthly average. But, you know, it fluctuates, of course, and that was from 1987. So if I look at the monthly average for the last 10 years, or for the last five years, it's going to be way more. It will be around six to seven lakhs on an average because prior to uh, prior to 2000, the travel wasn't as high as it is today. Um, the other point to quickly recap is 10 lakh people entered India in Feb. 3 lakh entered in March. So that is significant. We know more men are coming in compared to women. We know Bangladesh, USA, and UK are the top countries from which people are coming. Uh, we should also focus on three modes of transport. As I said, air, land, and sea. Cannot forget that. And then these were the reasons and types of visas on which people travel to India. So keeping these economic indicators in mind, I have a few questions for us to discuss. And this is an open discussion you can have with your family and friends. Or if you have responses to these questions, you can send me an email or send a WhatsApp message as well, just to engage in a discussion. So looking at the first fact, according to the Ministry of Tourism in India, over 30,000 foreigners have been stranded, okay? Uh, over 30,000 foreigners stranded in India were returned. So number of foreigners is of course more. If I go back and we look at the number of people who arrived, how many came? 10 lakhs and 3 lakhs. So from Feb, we easily had 13 lakhs. Some of them stayed, some of them left. So we have lakhs and lakhs of people in India of foreign origin out of them. Now, the positive news was that 30,000 have been returned home. So either India organized those flights or their home countries organized those flights. But basically, 30,000 foreigners have been returned home safely, okay, with rescue flights. Now my question is, with almost one lakh tourists still stranded in India who are non-citizens, where are they? So if you look at the numbers before about people arriving and we see that 30,000 are um, rescued, if you do the math, 
still, if you, if, you, if you consider some would have left before, some would have stayed back. If I compare the length of stay as well, if I consider the average length of stay, I can still confidently say easily there are more than one lakh tourists or foreign visitors still in India. The question is, where are they? Because I don't hear about one lakh foreigners stranded in India. So definitely what's going on with them is something we need to focus on. The media needs to highlight or we need to um, engage in this discussion. How are they surviving in a foreign country? So if imagine you are visiting a foreign country and you get stranded, how are you going to survive? Many times these travelers only carry the amount of cash or they're only prepared to spend for the duration of their stay. Okay, now some of you might argue and say, well, they should have money in their accounts, but let us be practical. Not everybody plans that well. And many times people plan their finances on the go as well. There are that category. We have to keep that in mind. So how are these people surviving in a foreign country? Um, they might need cash. They might need to go to ATMs. Sometimes the foreign credit card doesn't work. And many places, if it's an international credit card, I face that problem in India a lot my credit card from Australia, even if it's a MasterCard, in half the places in India, it just doesn't work because they say we don't use, we don't accept uh, a foreign credit card, even if it's a MasterCard, which is technically supposed to work around the world. So that could be a problem. It's not just about money. What if they have money, but they cannot access their money because of the lockdown? Which hotels do you think these tourists are living in? I know there was a news that said there were six, of, six uh, foreign tourists found isolating themselves in a cave in India. That is six. I'm talking about lakhs of people. So where are the other people? I mean, are they in other caves? Are they living with Indian families? Are they living in hotels? If they're living in hotels, um, how are the hotels managing these people with the restrictions in place because the staff won't be allowed to operate or has the hotel turned them out? Are they living there illegally? What's going on? If they are living with Indian families, for instance, why isn't the media covering the acts of kindness of Indian families hosting these foreign tourists? These are a lot of areas that haven't been explored. We don't have answers to these. We don't have reliable answers. There could be rumors. So this is where I feel uh, we need to really focus on. Our media needs to focus as well. And we need to question this data, not question the data, but the data shows that there are easily one lakh foreigners in India. We have to question where they are. If we know, good to tell. Tell me, let me know. Um, share the news with me as well. So update me if you know what's going on with them. Because as a country, of course, we should care for the citizens of our country. But it's also a responsibility to look after the visitors from other countries because they are going to report how we um, uh, treated them once they go back. Okay, and word of mouth really works. The network theory literally states if your family, friends, and word of mouth really works uh, in your favor or against you when it comes to traveling overseas. So I think this point is very, very critical. My next point is a majority of arrivals in India were from Bangladesh, USA, and UK. We just saw the data, right? So if this, considering this fact, my question for everyone for discussion is, if these arrivals were during the outbreak, and it is believed that the significant spread of virus was from China. That's what everyone around the world is saying right now. Why have the cases in India increased exponentially? Now, I'm not looking for a right or wrong answer. I'm looking for an open-ended discussion here. People from China haven't come to India in large numbers. And the world is blaming China for the outbreak as the epicenter of the outbreak of COVID-19. If that global blame is to be believed. My question is, um, people from Bangladesh, USA, and UK were the majority. They were almost a quarter of all the arrivals coming to India. If these countries were, the people of these countries were the ones coming to India, why have we seen an exponential, an outburst, a breakout, you know, a huge growth, a sharp steep rise in the COVID-19 cases in India. So why could that be? I'm sure all of you have different ideas, perspective, news, and data. I'm sure we could all have a discussion about it on WhatsApp or through email. So on that note, I would like to thank everyone for attending this particular lecture. It was very focused on India and the closure of border and who is coming to India. How are they coming? 
why are they coming and what is happening to the ones who are here in my future videos i will also talk about the contribution of the tourists arriving there will be videos where i'll talk about the economy being shut down the effects of the economy on people in india in australia and other countries I'll also talk about ways to recover from the crisis and I'll also talk about different um, situations that are unique around the world. So stay tuned. There will be a few more videos, a lot more videos coming up, actually. And I hope to engage with you with all of those. So thank you very much for attending.